In section one, we will review, review indications for intubation as well as the classification of respiratory failure. A number of disease processes can each individually lead to the need to place a patient on the ventilator. Ultimately, however, there is no one single level of any vital sign, physical exam finding, or lab value that individually mandates the patient should or should not be placed on the ventilator. Globally speaking, the disease processes which lead to the need for mechanical ventilation can fall into several distinct categories. Ventilatory problems can lead to respiratory failure, either in the patient who is not breathing at all, or much more commonly in those patients who are huffing and puffing at such a high, at such a high rate and level of effort that you know they will not be able to sustain that level of activity indefinitely, ultimately leading to respiratory muscle fatigue and respiratory failure. If you can't fix the underlying process leading to this excessive ventilatory load, the patient must be intubated. Similarly, while there is no one level of hypoxia which mandates intubation, clearly hypoxia can lead to respiratory failure, and if hypoxia cannot be fixed non-invasively and promptly, the patient will require intubation. Occasionally, patients must be intubated simply for issues related to airway protection or secretions. Ultimately, however, the decision to intubate rests largely upon identifying the presence of the look, the look of a patient who is going to die due to one of these other processes if you are unable to address those processes non-invasively. At the time the patient is intubated, all too often the physician focuses on the ventilator settings and various other um, diagnostic tests and therapeutic regimens without contemplating why exactly the patient developed respiratory failure. In general, the vast majority of patients are intubated due to one of two types of respiratory failure. Type 1, or acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, uh, is that category of diseases where the patient is intubated because of severe refractory hypoxemia. Type 2, or acute ventilatory failure, applies to those patients who get intubated largely because of an imbalance between the patient's load, i.e. those things making the patient breathe, versus the patient's strength. The patients may not necessarily be hypercapnic, in fact they usually are not, but they will all evidence manifestations of an increased work of breathing. With an acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, there are a number of etiologies, which can be broken down into those diseases associated with normal alveoli and those associated with abnormal alveoli. Intracardiac shunts, such as a propatent foramen ovale, VSDs or ASDs can lead to intracardiac shunting and severe refractory hypoxemic respiratory failure, as can intrapulmonary shunts, such as those associated with arteriovenous malformations, or which can be seen in patients with the hepatopulmonary syndrome. More commonly in the medical intensive care unit, patients with hy acute hypoxemic respiratory failure are identified uh, in the settings of pulmonary edema, pneumonia, alveolar hemorrhage, and or atelectasis. The pulmonary edema can be the result of high pressure congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema, as well as low pressure capillary leak ARDS edema. And then somewhat unique scenarios of neurogenic pulmonary edema or opiate uh, associated pulmonary edema can be present when a mixed pattern. The Normal alveoli disease processes rarely present acutely, whereas the diseases associated with abnormal alveoli are commonly encountered in the hospitalized patient. Graphically, the mechanisms of shunt can largely be grouped into those associated with abnormal alve alveoli containing blood, pus, or water, as in alveolar hemorrhage, pneumonia, or pulmonary edema. Conversely, Normal alveolar causes of shunt include cardiac shunts or AVMs where a distinct path from the right side of the circulation to the left side of the circulation occurs without passing by the proximity of an alveolus. And in the hepatopulmonary syndrome, a rather unique scenario develops in which the abnormally dilated capillaries in the pulmonary circulation are similar to the dilated T-linked seen in the skin of patients with cirrhosis. 
The abnormally dilated capillary itself provides a diffusion barrier such that the blood at the far edge of this capillary is inadequately oxygenated, resulting in acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. Compared to acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, acute ventilatory failure represents an imbalance between the load placed on the respiratory system and the patient's strength. Loads can come from increased airways resistance, such as might be seen in COPD or asthma. Load can result from an increased respiratory system elastance, as might be seen in patients with parenchymal interstitial lung disease, as well as effusions or chest wall disorders. And load can result from an underlying metabolic acidosis, such as is seen in diabetic ketoacidosis or sepsis. Causes of decreased strength include a reduced central nervous system drive, impaired transmission from the spinal cord to the neuromuscular junction, as well as intrinsic diaphragmatic muscle weakness. I like this quote attributed to Yogi Berra, which states that if you don't know where you're going, you might wind up someplace else. Your best chance of getting the patient off the ventilator successfully is to identify what's requiring ventilation to begin with, and it's imperative that at the time of stabilizing the patient on the ventilator, the physician make an attempt to figure out exactly why the patient's respiratory failure developed in the first place.